event of death or disappearance to know the victim's fate. This post repression openness about the past is a strong example of the theory that experiences of shame about the past stimulate historical awareness. Such openness is a relatively recent phenomenon, however. There have been many past repression transitions in the further past without exceptional moments of historical awareness. Forgetting was the rule. Some presently consolidated democracies have lived surprisingly long without coping with the violent parts of their past or the distorted old versions of their history at all. Since the 1970s, the thinking about how to deal with impunity and reparation after gross injustice has markedly evolved. Even in, in this more favorable international context, the urge for the truth does not appear in each and every new or historic <coughs> democracy. And where it does, the quest for historical truth can soon be shoved aside by competing goals, such as the need for stability and welfare. In addition, the risks of dealing with a painful past, though not as bad as under non-democratic rule, are still considerable. It can reopen old wounds and revive old conflicts. It has often been shown that intense but chauvinistic history education is a form of indoctrination that in the end can help ignite conflict and violence. From this sketch I conclude that democracies do not necessarily possess a stronger historical awareness than non-democratic regimes. Not necessarily. If they do, it can erode. If it does not erode, it is not necessarily supportive of democracy. If, in contrast, a democratic historical awareness can be nurtured, it can lend support to a democratic climate and culture, and so to democracy itself. Let us now see under which conditions historical writing helps foment a democratic historical awareness. I shall first examine whether democracy is a condition for responsible historical writing. A preliminary question is whether democracy is needed for science in general. Timothy Ferris has proposed the strong claim that in Europe and North America, the democratic revolution and the scientific revolution have evolved together since the late 18th, 18th century. Carl Sagan has defended the even stronger claim that science and democracy began in the same time and place, Greece in the 7th and 6th uh, centuries before common era. These attractive claims are untenable. Like historical awareness, science preceded democracy as we presently understand it in time. The investigative spirit is common to all cultures. In particular, the scientific revolution originating in the 17th century and then already founded on strong antecedents took place in a historical context of absolutism. In addition, it arose in England, despite the political turmoil that characterized this country for most of the 17th century. This su suggests that science is not dependent on a democratic context to emerge and to develop. It is viable 
in undemocratic environments, although the latter lack many of the conditions for it to prosper. <coughs> there is no relationship between democracy and the possibility of science. While defending their grand thesis, however, Sagan and Ferris presented convincing examples to prove a more modest claim that the relationship between democracy and lasting progress in science is necessary. Ferris, for instance, documented the sometimes spectacular failure of science in totalitarian environments. The more modest claim holds to the extent that democratic societies are liberal, that is, guarantee a work environment that respects and protects the human rights that individual scholars need for their work, in particular, freedom of expression. All democratic states in the world have committed themselves to these goals by ratifying the United Nations covenants. In doing so, they are required to develop a framework of laws and other measures to facilitate the right to science. Let us now look at democracy as a condition for responsible historical writing itself. The reasoning here is similar as for science. In principle, democracy is not a necessary condition for the possibility of responsible historical writing. <coughs> Much responsible historical <coughs> writing clearly preceded democracy or has existed in non-democratic <coughs> environments, albeit under unfavorable circumstances, on a limited scale, and often at great risk for the historians involved. In general, however, non-democratic rule tends to abuse and harm historical writing or marginalize it. In contrast, democracy fosters it, or at least, at the very least, does not hamper it. In Europe, professional historical writing, infused by a co coherent set of ethical rules, <coughs> has developed on a significant scale only from the early 19th century. That is, after the demise of absolutism in the late 18th century and the rise of democracy and human rights. If democracy then does not constitute a necessary condition for the emergence of responsible historical writing, it does so for its sustained practice. The general state duties to protect human rights, including the right to science, can be specified for the field of history. And let me clarify this for a second. These state duties tell us that states should regulate such vital areas as freedom of information, data protection and privacy, reputation, copyright, archives and heritage, and hate speech and discrimination. Furthermore, according to the international covenants, states should facilitate research, including historical research and teaching at all levels, and stimulate science and culture. In the context of the right to the truth, states have a duty to investigate and punish past atrocities. In the realm of memory, they should facilitate, though not impose, the exercise of the right to mourn and commemorate in a dignified manner. But not only states have obligations, also, historians and history teachers themselves have one inescapable political duty. If they want to encourage 
responsible forms of history, they should support democracy. Is responsible historical writing, in its turn, a condition for democracy? Let me first dwell for an instant on science in general. A few thoughts on the influence of, si of science on democracy must suffice. Okay. Roughly, four claims can be distinguished. Science is sufficient for democracy. It is not sufficient but necessary. It is not necessary but important. It is not important. With the exception of those exalting or debunking science, most observers would, I believe, firmly reject the first and the last claims. Sagan and Ferris pointed out that many of the 18th century enlightened protagonists of democracy had an exceptional interest in science. In these formative stages of the development of democratic practice, science already played an important role. This role has since become only more imperative. Consider the complexity and variety of public policies undertaken in modern democracies. Science often plays a dominant role in formulating the options on which these manifold policies are based, hence their name, evidence-based policies. Science has a respectable record in the service of democracy, despite its sometimes chaotic application in a political environment, and despite the abuses it may be subjected to for private interests. Most participants in this debate would probably settle on the view that science is important and often necessary for democracy. Does this also hold for the relationship between responsible historical writing and democracy? To answer this question, I will examine four claims that responsible historical writing has negative or no effect on a democratic society. This I call the zero thesis. Second, that it reflects a democratic society. This I will call the mirror thesis. That, third, that it strengthens a democratic society. This I call the amplifier thesis. And finally, that responsible historical writing shapes a democratic society. And this I will call the midwife thesis. The zero thesis is irreconcilable with the other three. Since there is evidence for at least two of the other theses, as I shall demonstrate in a minute, we can reject the zero thesis. This zero thesis, however, however, helps remind us that the effect of historical writing, when it exists, is not necessarily considerable. And when it is generally positive, it could still be negative in particular, particular cycles. <coughs> the mirror thesis can be partially confirmed by pointing to the <coughs> parallel parallels between the operation of historical writing and the operation of political democracy. In their work, historians use values that are central to democracy. For example, freedom of expression and information, including the plurality of opinions and tolerance of an unconventional opinion. They use a public and critical debate in which opinions are publicly tested, accepted or rejected. Although tradition 
is important in both historical writing and democracy, merit ultimately trumps origin in evaluating findings. The systematic doubt that is the basis of evidential tests in history finds a parallel in democratic politics, which by allowing and even encouraging political opposition and public scrutiny of government <coughs> also integrates the principle of uncertainty into its core. The tentative and open-ended character of the truth-seeking operation in history is paralleled by the experimental character of democratic policies. Furthermore, the practice of historians of presenting evidence in clearly accumulating steps and of logically explaining problems corresponds to the democratic requirements of accountability and transparency. Transparency, sorry. And historical scholarship and democratic accountability are both self-corrective in that they possess the capacity to learn from mistakes. All these parallels suggest that the relationship between democracy and historical writing is procedural. The operation of historical writing reflects some values central to the operation of democracy. Perhaps this conclusion was to be expected as the parallels were drawn from what I called an idealized presentation of the practices of historical writing and democracy. But it is also mitigated by the fact that the parallels are far from perfect. While science and democracy both have an inherently experimental character, experiment in history is only possible to a small degree, unless one is prepared to call the testing of hypotheses with unique, non-replicable evidence a form of experimentation. My assumption, nevertheless, is that the parallels are not superficial, in that they lay bare the <coughs> democratic elements in the infrastructure <coughs> of responsible historical writing. The parallels are clearest for historical research. The tentative character